My name is Chris Bacon. I work at Google. I'm based in London in the UK. Um, and I'm one of the very few .NET developers within Google because it's not a uh, C# isn't a language and .NET isn't a runtime system that we use well at all within Google. Um, I work on the cloud uh, within the cloud organization producing client libraries so that people outside of Google can access Google services from uh, C# -sharp. Um, but this talk is nothing about that whatsoever. Uh, so this talk is about, inside the CLR, the bits you'll never really need to know. So I'm very glad to see anyone here at all, because honestly, there's nothing useful to your day-to-day -day work that will come out of this talk. Um, however, I personally find this technically very interesting, um, quite a fascinating subject. Uh, we use the .NET runtime every day, we use it a huge amount. Um, but we don't often stop to think about how it works, what's going on inside. Uh, so today, we're going to take an hour to stop and think about what's going on inside. Not just think about it, see it. I'm hoping, um, if everything works, we'll demonstrate a whole load of, um, uh, of code that shows what's going on. Uh, and just to be very clear, this is nothing to do with my work at Google. Google is not writing an alternative .NET runtime. So don't look for it, it's not happening. Uh, it's purely a personal obsession. obsession. Um, so, just to be clear what we're going to do in this, in this hour, we are going to take a very, very simple c -sharp program. We're going to compile it using the normal Microsoft c -sharp compiler. Um, that produces intermediate language bytecode uh, in an XE or a DLL file. We're going to look at what's actually inside that XE or DLL file. Um, and we're going to write some code in C that will let us load that file, and then, time permitting, we'll see how far we can get through to actually executing code that's in that file. So we're going to be executing the code using our own runtime. We're not going to be using the Microsoft runtime or the Mono runtime or the .NET Core runtime. We're going to see if we can just write our own runtime in C that can take that code and execute it. Now, obviously, we're not going to do a very complete job at this because .NET is huge. Um, but I think you might be pleasantly surprised to see how little code we need to write to actually get stuff working that's, that's more than you might expect. So that over, let's get going. So first of all, um, obviously, I've got Visual Studio open here. Um, I have a solution prepared uh, which contains three projects. So the first project is a Hello World project. And as you might expect, um, that contains a program.cs file. And I'll just make the size a bit more reasonable. And this is your classic Hello World program. So you'd think, well, let's try and execute this. Surely this is as simple as you can get. Well, of course, it isn't. And in fact, this is quite complicated. Um, what we're actually going to do is comment out this, this line because it adds complexity that we don't, we don't want. Um, so this actually is the program we're going to try and execute first. And so we'll build that. So we've built that. And then I've got IL spy here, which lets us look uh, at what we've just built. So this is our Hello World program. And just to be, again, clear, um, when I built that, it created this Hello World.dll file here. Um, and this is the directory when we run our C program that's going to execute this DLL or load this DLL. Uh, this is the current working directory. Well, it was. And it still is. Good. This is the current working directory we're going to use. Um, so we build it using the standard c -sharp compiler. It's created this hello world.dl file here. So we'll look at this in IL spy. Uh, we have our program, and we have our main method here. Now, this is the simplest program you can possibly write in .NET. So all this is, it's our main method. It takes a string argument, and it's got a single instruction which is return. Right, good. So that's what we're going to be looking at to start with. So that's our Hello World program, which you've now built. Um, we then have this net demo project, which is the actual project that is written in C that we're going to use to open that DLL, load that DLL. Um, we then also at the bottom here have this system.console. Um, we'll get to this later. It's not something we need just yet. You may be able to guess 
why we need this, uh, but we'll get to that later. So main.c. So we're now in C. This is not C sharp. Um, in C, the entry point method, it, like C sharp, is called main. Uh, and at the moment, we've got a big to do here. And all we do is we print f, we print something to the console, and then we wait for a key press um, before we exit the program. And I'll just run this. It does nothing, of course, but just to show that we can run C code, here we are, press enter to exit. We're done. OK, so we're set up. Uh, I've arranged it so that this program is called with a single parameter on the, on the command line, which is the name of the DLL or XC we want to execute. So um, what do we need to do? Well, obviously, the first thing we need to do is to load the file. Um, and I have a method already, a function already written called load file. So we pass into it the first argument, um, which will be the file name. And in a moment, I'll debug into this so we can see what's going on. Um, but before we do, you may be saying, well, OK, load the file. We can load it into memory, fine. But how do we know what's inside this file? How, how do we even start to uh, understand what's in this file? And the answer, of course, lies in the specification. So this is the ECMA specification number 335 for the, as it says just off the bottom of the screen, the CLI, the Common Language Infrastructure. And this is a complete description of what is inside a .NET executable file. And it is sufficiently complete that you can go away and just using this document, you can write from scratch a .NET, executable, a .NET uh, execution runtime. Um, now, you might see this is a sixth edition dated June 2012. And you might say, oh, that's a bit old, isn't it? Surely things have changed. Um, actually, this spec was written back in 2005. This is just a minor update to it. And you might say, well, 2005, that's ridiculous. It's, it's so out of date. Um, but actually, that's not true. Uh, if you were in Jeff's talk just earlier, he commented that there were big changes to introduce generics to the CLR back in 2005 for, for C Sharp version 2. And since then, there have been no major updates to this CLR at all. There have been many, many updates to C Sharp, which I've got a Wikipedia page here that describes them or well, doesn't list them, rather. Um, but they all compile down to the same instruction set that's been existing since 2005. So it is correct that we're using what seems like quite an old specification. Um, this is, as a side note, this is about to change. Uh, for C Sharp 8, they are apparently going to introduce interface default implementations of methods. This requires a change to the CLR. So there will be a new specification of the CLR um, but that hasn't happened yet, so what I'm saying is still, still valid. Um, so this is the specification, and when we load a file, this is the section of the specification we need, and it's, uh, as you can see, it's called the structure of the runtime file format. Right, we'll look into the details of this in a moment, but first of all, let's run some code. So I'm going to stick a breakpoint here. I'm going to run the program. Um, it's compiling. And it's running. And we've, oh, that's curious. It didn't stop. OK, it stops at, did I add the breakpoint in the wrong place? Hmm. I'm confused why it didn't stop at this breakpoint. Uh, well, let's, let's uh, stick another breakpoint here. We'll cancel that run. And we'll, we'll run it again. Hopefully, it'll stop at the correct place. Here we are. OK, so we're going to load a file. Uh, first of all, just print out the name of the file just to confirm that we're doing the right thing. Yep, load file, hello world.dll, that's what we expect. Um, and then we're going to just load it into memory. So we're going to do that just using standard C code to do so. So we open the file, we found out the length of it, we seek back to the beginning of the file, we allocate enough memory, that's the malloc call, that's memory allocate. Uh, we allocate enough memory for the whole file. Now, obviously, you wouldn't do this for a real runtime, but this isn't a real runtime, it's just a demonstration runtime. Uh, and then we read the whole file, and then we close the file. So now, in pdata, that's now a pointer to a memory that contains the whole file. Right, what do we do next? Well, we look at the specification. That's always what we fall back to. So this is the organization of the file. We have these things called PE headers at the very beginning, so they start to offset zero in the file. PE stands for portable execu executable, and it's a, it's a standard that, that Windows has used for literally decades to describe executable files. We then have various other things, CLI headers, 
CLI data, and then native image sections, whatever they are. Um, so we're going to start off with the PE headers, which start at offset zero in the file. And this is where we have to start to navigate our way through all this metadata. Now, you may be thinking, all this talk about metadata and all this stuff, how do we actually, we want to execute code. We're not interested in metadata. But of course, you have to go through all the metadata before you can find the code to execute. So this talk is very much split into two sections. The first section is navigating the metadata. And then the second section is executing the code. So accessing the metadata, um, it requires a fair amount of detailed you know, loading the right stuff from the right places in the file. And I'm going to skip over an, uh, a fair amount of the detail because I want to get on to executing the code sooner rather than later. Um, I will just mention a couple of interesting things. So the first thing is that the, uh, the very beginning of the file is this thing called the MS-DOS header. And of course, MS-DOS is like from, as I say, decades ago. And the reason it still starts with the MS-DOS header is because Microsoft have a massive commitment to backward compatibility. And believe it or not, you could take that executable we've just, we've just compiled, and you could run it on MS-DOS, as in from 25 years ago. Obviously, it wouldn't run the program, but it would run enough of the program to be able to print out an error message saying, this program can't run on MS-DOS. Uh, and I can demonstrate very soon, actually, we'll see um, an example of that. Now, the first thing you'll notice is that the first two characters of an MS-DOS header are 4D and 5A, which in ASCII are capital M, capital Z. This is the executable file signature, and apparently MZ were the initials of one of the programmers on very early MS-DOS. Uh, and his initials have stuck in the executable file format ever since. So the first thing we're going to do is um, create a pointer to the MS-DOS header, which is the same as the data because it starts at offset zero. And then we're going to check that the first two characters are indeed capital M and capital Z. Uh, so this macro I've got to find here, it, it just pulls out a value of the type char from the pointer MS-DOS header at the zeroth offset. So we're checking that's M, and then the first offset is Z. So hopefully this should, and it passed, it would have, it would have crashed out with a message, not an executable. Uh, and now we can confidently print out this is an executable. And it is, so good news. Um, now, I'll just whiz into the memory dump. And if I just navigate in memory here, then you can see this interesting text string. This program cannot be run in DOS mode. Um, and that'll be printed out if you try and run this on DOS, which we're not going to, so we won't see it. Very good. So we now have this MS-DOS header. And the only thing we care about in this MS-DOS header is this four-byte value here called LFA new. I don't know what that stands for, uh, but it contains an offset into the file to the next header, the next bit of metadata we care about. So what we do in this C program is we read LFA new, which is an offset 3C into the MS-DOS header. And I know it's offset 3C because it says so just here at offset 3C. Uh, and then we can now find out if it's actually a .NET executable. And the way we do that is we go and look at the definition of the PE file header, which is what the LFA new structure pointed to. Um, and this machine field, which is an offset 0 in the header, in this new header, uh, and is size 2, it's a short 16-bit number, uh, should be 14C hex. And so we will. We will do that. So you can see here we've got a pointer to the PE header, the portable executable header. Uh, and you might say, well, why are you doing that an offset of plus 4 from LFA new? And that's because the PE header is prefixed by the PE signature, which is a 4-byte well-known value that we don't care about. So we go 4 bytes after. And then we're just going to check that the short value at the PE header offset 0 is indeed 14C. And it is. It didn't crash. So we should now have printed out it is a .NET executable. So good news. We're, we've loaded the right file, at least. Um, great. Now, there's a whole load of more metadata stuff that, if this was a two-hour talk, I would go into a huge amount of detail about, because some of it's quite interesting. And I, am, I have already got breakpoints, so just a couple of interesting points. Um, but basically, I'm just going to run the code now and let it load, load a whole load of metadata. Now, this isn't as complicated as you might think. You can see that this C program, we're currently on line 162-ish. Um, and this whole method to load the metadata ends at line 238. 
So this is less than 100 lines of C code to load enough metadata that we can execute later or video execute code. So I'm just going to continue executing. And we've now got a breakpoint at this part. In the, so we're still loading metadata here. And the reason I've stopped here is because these are, we're now at the point where we're looking at metadata, metadata that really is to do with .NET executions. And there are five metadata tables um, stored in the file, of which, I wonder if I can find, here we are. So this is now, we've gone back to the specification, and this section here, 24.2, is where it describes what all these metadata tables are. So the one we've currently stopped at, unfortunately, is the most complex, uh, and it's called the hash tilde stream. Nice name. Um, but it contains all the metadata for every part of your C-sharp program. So for example, every method you've defined, every parameter you've defined in a method, every generic parameter has a metadata table that represents that part of metadata. And here is a list of all of the metadata tables. Some of these won't be obvious what they are. Some will be. So in fact, most of these are not obvious. Uh, Presumably, event, the one down here, means that all events fields, well, are they fields? Anyway, all events declared in your c -sharp code get an entry in the event table. Um, some which are much more obvious are method def here. So method def is table number six, and it contains the definition of every method. So there's an entry in this table for every method that you define. And we'll get onto this in much more detail fairly soon. Um, so that's what the tilde stream is. We'll then continue. Uh, we now have the strings table. Now, this contains all these system strings in your program. So they're not user strings. These are not when you declare a, a, a string constant. It's not those. It's all the things like the names of your classes. And what we can do is we can just jump to the memory that contains this stream. And you can see here, there's all kinds of text that looks kind of the right kind of stuff that you'd expect to see in a .NET file. So you've got hello world. That's the name of our our program, system.runtime, .debuggable attribute, .assembly title attribute. Don't know exactly what that's for, but it sounds about right. Um, and you've got uh, main down here. That's the name of our method. So we've already got, we've gone through a number of metadata steps that we haven't covered in detail. But we're now at the point where we're looking at data that is correct. It's this kind of stuff you'd expect to see in a .NET executable. So let's get rid of that memory. Um, and now we'll continue executing. So we're still loading metadata. And now we're in the, in the hash us stream. And this stream contains the user strings. Us stands for user strings. And so all string constants that are defined in your C sharp or F sharp, whatever language you're using, um, have an entry in here. Now at the moment, if you go back to our, our program, we have no string constants. So there are no entries in this table. So we won't go and look at it yet. Later on, we may um, get some string constants, so we'll, we'll look at them. But this stream is now is currently empty. Good. So we'll carry on running. Hmm. And now it triggers that breakpoint. That is curious. Uh, and we'll continue running. And we've loaded the metadata. So just to quickly read through what we've done, uh, we've checked that it's executable. We've checked it's a .NET executable. Uh, the stuff to sections is, is a detail of how the memory is laid out within the file. Unfortunately, they use a thing called relative virtual addressing inside the file. So bytes are not addressed by offset, which would be easy, but instead they're addressed by a kind of an indirection scheme called RVA, which we won't go into. Uh, we've determined that this is expecting a runtime version 2.5. Now, you might say 2.5. I've never heard of that version number. Um, it's a CLR kind of internal version number. It's not a version of anything you ever see uh, when you're writing code. Um, we have an entry point token. Now, the entry point, of course, is the method that you call to start your program running. Um, it's that token has obviously got some kind of structure. The high byte is 6. The low 24 bits is 1. We'll come on to what this means in more detail later. Uh, the CLI version, 4.0. Um, now, this is not, again, this is a version number you don't come across very often. But interestingly, I did find that uh, if you go to your Windows, Microsoft .NET framework directory, then you can see here, I do indeed have framework 4.0.3319 installed. Um, but of course, we're not using this runtime. We're writing our own runtime. But it's that version number that, it, that, that it's printed out. Uh, and we found some streams. And we loaded entries from various tables. 
Now, these tables, as I was saying, were the things like method def tables. So, entry six, table six, uh, table six is the method def table, and we have two entries in the method def table. So, that's this table here, and uh, it's number six. Now, you might say, why have we got two methods in our method def table? Because our program only has one method. Uh, but, of course, this is not a static class, so the compiler automatically generates a default constructor for us. Uh, so that's the second method. If we made this static, there would only be one method. Maybe I should have made it static. I don't know. Um, right, so back to here. And we found all the other streams, the hash strings. The, the GUID stream and the blob stream we're not going to talk about. They're not relevant for what we're doing right now. OK, so good news. We've loaded our file. So how do we execute that file? Well, the first thing we have to do is deal with that entry point token. So what is that entry point token? So hopefully by now you've probably figured out that the six in the high byte is saying it's from metadata table six, which is method def, and the one is saying it's index one into that table. And that is exactly correct. That's what it is. Uh, so what we need to do is load, the, load that entry in the table. So we're going to load the entry point and oh, entry point, entry point. Uh, and I've already got defined a type which, which defines everything that's in the method def entry. And we are going to create a pointer to entry point method def. And I already have a method written in C called get method by token. Um, and the question is, what have we done? Wh where did we get the token from? Have we stored it? Well, the answer is yes, because this load file method uh, function returns a T file structure, and it, it uh, populates every entry in here. And you can see that this second field is an entry point token. So that's where we stored it when we were loading the metadata. You'll also see that we also stored the pointer to the strings and a pointer to the user strings, and um, we recorded all the metadata table data as well. Uh, it's hard-coded to 64 because in the current specification, 64 is the largest number of tables that can exist. Um, although there aren't actually 64 tables yet defined. There's about 48, I think. Uh, OK, so we get method by token. And the token we need is the entry point token. Um, and when we've got that, we can, then, uh, we can then actually print out what the method's called, which is nice because then we can confirm um, that it's what we expect. Of course, we expect it to be main. Uh, this is C, so we have to use these slightly unpleasant formatting um, uh, printf statements. And so we have this entry point method def, and you can see here we have a field called name index. So that this isn't, unfortunately, a direct pointer to the name. It's a pointer. It's, it's an index into the strings table that we looked at earlier from the metadata tables. So we now know the index, so the question is, how do we get it out? And it's not difficult, but I did just write a macro to do this because it is, there is just a little bit of fiddly pointer arithmetic you have to do, which I didn't want to get wrong uh, in this talk. So we have a macro, uh, which has to take the file. The reason we need the file is because we need to load the index from the correct strings metadata. If we're loading multiple files, think about when we start loading libraries, um, we need to make sure we're loading it from the correct uh, strings metadata file. And that should be that. OK, we have an error. What about I'm wrong? Aha. Yes, this needs the file as well. OK, so now we're going to load the method and print out the name. Um, I've probably got breakpoints I need to gradually get rid of. So we'll find out when it stops. So we're running it again. And yep, let's get rid of that breakpoint. Carry on. Get rid of that breakpoint. Carry on, get rid of that breakpoint, carry on, and that breakpoint, and carry on. Right, so now we've loaded uh, the method, and we can just look at this structure, and we can see it's got everything filled in. So we've got uh, things that we don't really care about, but we've got the name index of 127 hex, um, and we've got this RVA. Now, one of the things that you expect to find in a method definition, of course, is the IL, the bytecode for the method. And this RVA is the offset, the RVA offset, where the IL exists. So this lets us redirect and, and read the IL, which we'll do very soon. So if we carry on running, uh, we should 
find that we've got, yes, we do, an entry point method named main, which is what we expect, good news. So this is all going very nicely. We've got to the point now where we can load a method def, we've got the name, so now what do we want to do? And of course the answer is, we want to execute it. So how do we do that? Well, before we execute it, when you execute code in .NET, there is a little bit of state we need to keep track of as we're executing. The obvious one is where we are in executing. Um, that's what is called an instruction pointer. We need to know which instruction we're currently, currently executing, what's our next instruction. Um, and we also need to keep track of, so .NET is a stack-based virtual machine. And so we need to have a stack. And that's an evaluation stack, it's not a call stack. So an evaluation stack means that, for example, if you want to add two numbers together, you push the two numbers onto the evaluation stack, you then call the add IL instruction, which then pulls off the top two numbers off the evaluation stack, adds them together, and pushes the answer back onto the evaluation stack. So .NET is not a register-based virtual machine, it's a stack-based virtual machine. So we also need to keep track of the stack and the stack pointer, so where we are in the stack. Um, so I have a method, as you would expect, called create method state. Uh, and we pass into this the entry point method. Uh, no, I was about to use var there, thinking C sharp, but of course C doesn't do var. Uh, I believe C++ now does, but not C. Um, so we will create a variable of type method state. Uh, and we now have that. And now we can call the execute method, which just takes a method state. So we are most of the way towards executing code. Uh, I'll just take a breakpoint there, and we'll just have a quick look inside this method state type. Um, so we've got the method state. Now, the method state type is defined like this. So we know which file the method came from. We have the method def. Uh, and then you can see here we've got a pointer to the IL. Uh, that's a void pointer. The, it could have been a byte pointer. Um, it, the IL is a variable length instruction set. So each, each instruction can take up a variable number of bytes. So um, we just keep a, a pointer to that. We have an instruction pointer that's initialized to zero. Uh, we have a stack. You'll see our stack is currently restricted to only being 32 bytes long. Obviously, that's not acceptable in a real runtime. But for a toy runtime, it's fine. Uh, and we have a stack pointer. Uh, we also have a locals. I don't think we're going to need those. But if you, obviously, when you use local variables in methods, they would go into that locals memory space. And again, 32 bytes is not how you, a fixed number of bytes being 32 is not how you do that in a real runtime, but it's fine for our toy runtime. Okay, so our method state contains all the stuff we'd expect. We have some IL, we have an instruction pointer, which is what we need to start with. So if we step into execute, oops, I meant to step into, we stepped over, never mind. Um, but it says it's executing method main, it's not because we haven't yet written the code to execute method main. So that's what we're going to do now. So if we go and look at this execute method, you can see it initializes a certain amount of state. Um, it prints out that it's executing the method, which we just saw. Uh, and then all it, it just keeps, it just gets a copy of the IL pointer and the stack pointer. They are immutable. So we, we just get a copy to make the code shorter as we're writing it. So how do we execute C -sharp, uh, .NET code? And this is where kind of the fun starts. So the first thing we need to do is have a loop because there's more than one instruction inside the IL. Um, we then need to get the opcode that we want to run next. So we'll, we'll do that as an unsigned char, which is sort of an unsigned byte. Uh, and we read it from the IL pointer at the method, oops, the method state instruction pointer, which starts at zero. So the first opcode we read will be um, at offset zero, we then have to increment the instruction pointer to move our execution onto the next instruction. Uh, and then we'll print out what instruction we're, we're doing. So we found the opcode, uh, and then this is the beautiful way to format a hex character. Uh, we've got OX, now percent O2X, right, so that will format it as a two character. Um, hex number, we'll then switch on the opcode and we'll make a default. Uh, now, by default, of course, we can't execute it, so we'll just put cannot execute. So, when we run this, we should find it, it prints out an opcode and then crashes because we don't yet know how to execute that opcode. 
Um, and it does. So we found opcode 2A, and then we crashed because we don't know how to execute opcode 2A. So what is opcode 2A? Well, hopefully, if you remember back to here, we'll hope it's return, otherwise something's gone horribly wrong. And it's a little bit small, but you can see on the left there that ret is indeed 2A. And if we go and look at the specification, then uh, if I find the right, right one. So these are all the opcodes in the IL. And 2A, which is just down here, is return. And here in the specification, we have the details of every single instruction. So as you can see, there's a fair few instructions. Uh, some are more complicated to implement than others. So this is return. And as you can see, it just says return from method, possibly with a value. Uh, so the same IL instruction is used whether you're returning void or returning a value. Um, and so that, that's all good. So that's the instruction we need to execute. So let's, uh, let's um, implement that instruction. This is the easiest one to do. So what was it? 2A, was it, I think? Yep. Uh, that's ret. And what do you do when you get a return instruction? You return. And so now we can run this, and this should execute that program. Let's see. We'll remove the breakpoint and carry on running. And there we are. So we executed 2A, we returned, which then exits our C program. So how about that? We have executed our C program, and we've done it in 400 lines of C, which I think is an amazingly small amount of code to execute a genuine c -sharp .net program. Of course, you might argue we've only implemented one instruction, and you'd be right to argue that. So let's do something a bit more interesting. Um, so what we're going to do is we're not going to do console.write line. Instead, all we're going to do is we're going to return a number from this, uh, this main method. Now, of course, this sets the exit code of the program, um, and this is kind of the simplest possible thing we can do next. So if we compile this, so we'll build that, we will wait till it's built, we'll look at IL spy, we'll refresh IL spy, um, and we'll go and have a look at what's now in the main method. And you can now see we just have one extra instruction. We have this LDC I4S 42. Now, the 42 is clearly the 42 we wrote in our C-sharp code. LDC I4S means load, constant, integer, four bytes, short. Short meaning it's a one byte number. So what it does is it takes one byte from the instruction sequence, but expands that into a four byte uh, integer. So we now need to implement that instruction in our code. Because if we run it right now, it will crash opcode 1f. We don't have to do that. Opcode 1f is, of course, that LDC instruction. Um, so let's implement that LDC instruction. So we have ox1f, which is ldc.i4.s. Uh, we need, and I always put the break in first, otherwise I remember. And the C compiler doesn't tell you when you've forgotten to put breaks in. Right, so how do we load an uh, LDC I4S? So what this has done is we've got the opcode in the IL stream. The next byte is the value 42. So what we need to do first is to read the value. And we will do that by reading a char. Notice it's signed because that byte value is signed, and it can represent numbers from minus 100 and whatever to 100 and whatever. Um, if you need a larger number than that, you use a different opcode that contains a four-byte number. So we read that, we read a, uh, a char from the next instruction pointer. We then obviously, oops, we then increment the instruction pointer. Um, we then, what do we then? We then have to store that on our evaluation stack. So, and it's now an integer. The the .NET runtime only knows about 32-bit and 64-bit numbers. It doesn't know about anything smaller than 32 bits. So the evaluation stack will never contain a short or a byte. It'll always contain a 32-bit integer. So it's the stack, and we need to put it at our stack pointer, which starts off at 0. And we set that to value. Um, and then we increment our stack pointer by 4, because an integer is a 4-byte value. So that's it. That's done. So we should now be able to execute this, and it should not crash. Let's see if I've done it right. There we are. So we've executed two instructions. Now, it'd be nice if we could actually print out the exit code, because um, we don't really know it's worked. Let's see if it really has worked. So all we'll do is, in our main function, after our execute, we'll then just write a little bit of code to find out if there was a value left on the evaluation stack at the end. 
Um, so if the stack pointer is at four, we'll just assume it's an integer because that's the only value that should ever be on the evaluation stack at the end of execution. Um, and we will read uh, entry point. No, no, not that. It's in the method state. Um, we will read the method state stack at offset zero. It has to be offset zero by specification. It says that you can only leave one value on the evaluation stack at the end of execution, and it has to be a four byte exit code. Um, and we'll print it out. So exited with exit code, and it is exit code. And then just for completeness, if we don't have an exit code, we'll just print out no exit code. Right. Oh, I've forgotten to put a counter return there. OK, so if we execute this, we should now see that it, ex it exits with an exit code. And it did, 42. So again, not that much more work to implement not major extra functionality, but definitely extra functionality. Um, so what shall we do next? Well, we now do ramp up the complexity a little bit. Uh, so the next thing we're going to do is implement a call. So we're going to have a static method, and we'll make it return an integer, an integer, because they're the simplest things to deal with. And we'll call it get a number. And because this is twice as good, we'll use twice the number. And then we'll return the, the return from get number. And that's now our exit code. We're just going to use the exit code as a way of outputting something from our program, because it's the easiest way to do it. Um, now, if we build that, and then go and look at IL spy to find out what's been generated. Um, oh, it, hasn't, it takes a bit of time just to do the build. Right, there we are. So now you can see we have a call, int32, hello world.program, get number. So int32 is the return type, hello world.program is the full name of the um, class, and get number is the, the method. This is a static method, so we're using the static call. It would be call vert if this was an instance method. They're more complicated. We're not going into virtual instance tables or that kind of stuff. Um, and then get number is also now defined. And you can see it's exactly the same instruction that we saw before, this LDC i4.s. And then it returns. So what this tells us is that whatever is on the evaluation stack at the end of the method, as we already know, is what is returned from a function to the, call, to the calling function. So let's execute this and find out what fails. And by the way, I wrote, uh, quite a few years back, I wrote an almost full runtime. And I did it like this. I just wrote C-sharp code, found out what didn't work, <laughs> and then implemented those things. So there are some opcodes that I still never implemented because the C-sharp compiler never generates them. Um, so we've got a crash, an opcode 28, 28. I would expect that to be called because that was the first instruction in our um, main method. So, and it is indeed. So 28 is called. And if we go and find the call definition here, then this is the specification for how you call a method. So you can see that the assembly format, what this means is on the instruction in the stream of IL, you get the call opcode, and then you get a method, kind of a thing that tells you what method it is you're calling. Now, as you might expect, this is a method def token that we've seen before. So it's a 32-bit it's number with six in the high byte, which says it's a method def, and then an index in the low 24 bits. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to read that off the IL stream. We're then going to find that method by token, which we already have a method to do that in our C code. Um, and then we'll execute it. So let's do that. So we need another um, case here, which is 28. Uh, and this is a call. Um, again, we need to do that, and always put the break in first, otherwise it's embarrassing. Right, so we need to load the token. So that is an integer in the IL stream at, of course, the instruction pointer. Uh, that's a 32-bit number, so we then need to increment the instruction pointer by four, and that's four bytes. Uh, and then we need to load the method def, which we did. Now, you might think this is familiar, and of course it is, because this is exactly what we did to get our entry point method. So we're actually going to do exactly the same thing. We're going to load a, a, a TMD method def um, type, and then create a method state, 
and then execute it. So it really is a duplicate of the code we've already seen. Um, so to carry on this code, we will, um, uh, what's next? Yes, so we, we have the call method def, so here's the method def of the method we're calling. We have this handy method, get method by token, uh, and obviously we're going to pass into that the token that we've just um, loaded from the IL stream. Uh, that probably needs a, a p file thing to make sure we're loading from the correct metadata. So when we have multiple files in memory, we have to make sure we load from the metadata of the same file that the IL stream is in. Um, so now we have a call method def. Uh, we then need to create a method state, which is a thing that keeps track of the instruction pointer and things like that. Um, so call method state, and we have our handy method create method state, which we pass in uh, like that. And then we really do just execute it like that. And of course, OK, I've made some mistakes. Let me just figure out what those are. Uh, so we create the method state. What's wrong there? Oh, yes. I need to make that a, a point to a method state. Uh, so we are now recursively calling our execute function. Uh, and this, this shows an interesting sort of design decision we've made. Uh, without even really realizing it, is we are currently using the C call stack as our .NET call stack. And this is not something you would probably do if you were doing this for real. Well, no, it certainly isn't what you do if you're doing it for real. And in fact, even if we went much further into this, we'd need to change this because there are various things like exception handling um, and a few other things that I can't quite recall, where it's much, much easier to do if you manage the call stack yourself and you don't have a recursive um, execute. However, for the, this example, recursion is absolutely fine. Um, now, we're going to, this is, we're going about to do something that's slightly painful now. We are going to cheat, and we're going to cheat for the first time. Everything we've done up to this point is basically correct. We've missed out a whole load of error handling and other stuff, but what we've done is correct. Um, we're now going to cheat, and we're just going to say, we know this returns a four byte integer. Um, we're not going to check, we're not going to handle different size return values um, correctly. So we're going to assume it returns an int 32. And so what we now need to do is remember when a function returns an int 32, it leaves it on its evaluation stack. We then have to copy it onto our evaluation stack. So we'll do that. Um, so we will, first of all, so when this, is, this val we're doing now is where we're writing it to. So it's our stack, um, and we need to write it to the stack pointer, and we need to get it from the integer that we get from the call method state stack. Uh, and this will always be at offset zero, because again, by definition, it's specified that the return value will always be at offset zero in the evaluation stack. OK. And then the last thing we need to do is just increase, is increment our evaluation stack by four, because we've just written a 32-bit integer to it. Right. So this should mean now that this program executes. Let's see if it does. And how about that? It does. So we have called a method, got a return value, made that our exit code, and it's 84. And just to take that one step further, and just to show how this stack-based machine works, what we can do is we can then add 42 to it. So presumably you can guess what instruction we're now going to have be missing. It's fairly obvious. It's the, oh, it's gone off the bottom. Um, it's the, oh. <laughs> I forgot to build it. Uh, let me just build that. And then we'll wait for that to build. And then we'll run it. And you should be able to guess what instruction is missing. It is, of course, opcode 58, which is add. Um, entirely expected. So if we just whiz back to our specification, we'll go down to opcode 58, which is indeed add. And if we look at add, in the full specification, it's add numeric values. And you can see it takes two values from the evaluation stack and then pushes the result to it. Now, interesting, um, you'll notice this isn't add integer, or which you might expect, it's just add. And that's because the way .NET works is it, it requires the, the, the execution, the runtime, to understand or to remember what's on the stack so it knows what kind of addition needs to be done. Um, Again, we're going to cheat, and 
we are just going to assume it's a 32-bit integer. So this was instruction 5.8. And I'm hoping now you can start to see that it's all, this is all fairly routine coding now. So it's not difficult to work out what I'm now about to write. I'm about to write value 1 equals val int. We need to pull it off the, the um, stack uh, at the stack pointer minus 4, because the stack pointer points to the next empty entry on the, um, on the stack. And I'm now going to do the same thing to get the second number we want to add. I could have copy-pasted that line, never mind. Uh, but of course, this one's minus 8, because we're hopping back two entries on the stack pointer. Um, we're then going to have a result, which is fairly predictably value 1 plus value 2. So this is implementing add in the most obvious way. And then we need to write that back onto the stack in the correct place. So I am now going to actually subtract 8 from the stack pointer. Um, and then we will write the result onto the stack. And then we do just need to then add 4 back onto the stack pointer. Yes, that could be done slightly more efficiently, but who cares? And now this program should work, and it should output what's 84 plus 42, 126. And it does. So we're now well on our way to implementing somewhat more of a .NET runtime than you might have expected in like 45 minutes, which is what we spent doing it. Um, the next thing we'd like to implement, of course, is this. Now, this adds three extra levels of complexity, which are fairly serious. So the first one is we're loading a string. That's not too complicated. The second one is we are calling a method with a parameter. And the third one is, and this is at the biggest, we're loading a method that is not in the current assembly. So console right line, of course, is in the base class library. It's in one of the, it used to be called MS Corelib. They've now, Microsoft have massively changed how the, the system libraries are arranged now. Um, I can't remember, I think it's in one called system.console now, which would make sense. Um, so we've introduced three levels of complexity. And if we just build this, you'll discover uh, that when we look at it in IL spy, we can clearly see where these levels, where, where these things are. So if we refresh this, uh, go back to main. So you can see here, we're loading a string, a string that's the LD str instruction. And we now have this constant. So this will now be in our hash US metadata stream that we were talked about earlier and was empty earlier, but now we have an entry in it. We then do a call, and you'll notice that this call is just the fully qualified name, but this call is system.console, but it's also got this system.console in square brackets, and that says it's in the assembly system.console. It's not in our local assembly. Um, so how do we implement all that? Well, let's, let's first run it, and we should find we crash. Opcode 72 is loadstra. So we'll start by implementing loadstra. And what this has to do is it has to take a offset off the, uh, it has to t take a token rather off the IL stream um, at the current instruction pointer. This is a token that tells it where that string is stored in the metadata. Uh, we do then have to increment our instruction pointer by four because uh, that's a 32-bit stream, 32-bit value. Um, we then have to load the string. Now, I have a method that does this for us already. Um, it's not horribly complicated. Uh, and as usual, it takes a file, so we know which metadata to load it from, and it takes the token. Uh, and basically, all this is doing is it's just getting the correct offset into the hash US stream, which we stored a pointer to earlier in the p-file structure. Um, and it returns a heap string type, which just contains the length of the string and then the character of the string. The string is UTF-16 because .NET uh, the specification is that it all user strings are stored as UTF-16. Um, and then after we've done that, we then need to write this to the evaluation stack. Um, so it's type p string, heap string, and then the offset we need to write to, as always, is the current evaluation stack. Oops, and we make that equal to p string. You'll notice that the evaluation stack is multiply typed, so whatever type has to go into there um, is put in there. 
and then we increment. Uh, we'll just do it by four. So I'm, this is a, another, another hack. Uh, this is running on a 32-bit. Uh, it's, it's creating a 32-bit executable, so we know that a pointer is uh, four bytes long. And that's it. We've done loadstra. Um, so we should now find that it crashes on whatever next instruction is it can't handle. Oh, no. Now, this might actually, this might actually crash in a more interesting way. Actually, has it crashed? It must have crashed. Oh, it's trying to load symbols. OK, so I'm um, not sure if this will work. I might need to cancel this. So what it's now trying to do is it's trying to execute this method, but it doesn't know how. We haven't told it how to execute a method, first of all, that isn't in our assembly, and secondly, isn't, well, we haven't got an implementation. What is our implementation of console or write line? And I'm just going to cancel this because it will take too long. Oh, I can't cancel it. No. <laughs> I wonder if I can just stop the whole thing. <laughs> oh, no. Ruined by the Microsoft symbol server. Which, by the way, is one of the least reliable things that Microsoft produce. Um, oh. OK. Um, so I don't know how long this is going to take to, to stop. Uh, but we've basically got to the end of what I wanted to do. Um, if this does stop, I might see if I can, I can quickly hack together the code to, to execute this. Uh, the, oh, I can't do anything. Um, so that system.console file that you can see tantalizingly in a tab that we can't look at is our implementation of console.writeline. And it's a massive cheat, because all it does is it says, this is an internally defined method. And what I was going to do was, in the C, we intercept the call when it's an internally defined method. And we say, aha, we're not going to execute this by executing IL. We're going to execute this by C code. And fairly predictably, all it does is it prints out whatever string the parameter said. Um, and that was, that was the end of where I wanted to get to. Uh, oh, except loading other libraries. Yes, because we had to load a separate library. And the way that works is beautifully simple. Because of course, we've already got the code to load a DLL. So we just call it again with the name of the DLL that we want to load. And it really does just work. Um, so you load that, and then because all the methods I wrote to execute functions take a file, so it knows which file it loaded from, you just pass it this new file we've loaded, and it just works. It's beautiful. So hopefully, you've learned that writing your own runtime is not as difficult as you might have expected. But also, I hope you understand, you shouldn't do it. <laughs> So thank you very much. I think there should just be a, a short time for questions, if anyone has any questions. I'll also be around. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, Chris.